Good morning, Gateway! It's a very wonderful Sunday. Let's all rise up. Let us be uh, at open gate and ancient doors, and let's just welcome the presence of God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. We sing praises and rejoicing to you, God. Thank you, God. Yeah. As we lift you up, you are riding on a praise. Come on. Being told over everything, you are seated in a praise. You sing. This is prophetic, I can feel it in the air. We lift our praise and you change the atmosphere. With hearts open now, everybody sing out.
Father, as we come before you in the spirit of worship, we invite your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Let us feel your embrace as we sing to you this song. May the song minister to everyone. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Another worship encounter with you. It gives us such encouragement to feel your presence, God. We bring you back all the glory, honor, and praise. And everyone says amen. Amen. One more time, church. Thank you, Gateway, for worshiping with us. Hey, Gateway. Happy Sunday and welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here today with us. If you're a guest with us, we'd love for you to do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You'll find that Connect card under the seat in front of you. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes as you're leaving today. This way we have a record of your visit and can send you an email acknowledging that you spent your Sunday with us. Also, those Connect cards are great for anyone to use as a tool to write down a prayer request or praise report. Just let us know anything you want us to agree with you in prayer for or any of the good things that God is doing in your life. Write them down on the back of that Connect card and drop it in the giving box today as well. We have some great Connect courses happening and we want to remind you and encourage you to stay connected. Sunday to Sunday can be really long, so it's great to connect in midweek if you're able to. Tuesday nights we have Celebrate Recovery happening. On Wednesday nights we have a great connect group called Unshakable with Pastor Rick Warren. On Friday nights there's Gateway Youth Movement. On Saturday mornings there's a great book reading on winning the war in your mind by Pastor Greg, Craig Rochelle. There's also a youth study group happening on Saturdays as well as a Zoom prayer meeting. So make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar for everything you need to know about what's happening at the church. There is a special event happening this Friday and we are excited about it. It's our first water baptism celebration in quite a long time, so we're happy to get back into the groove of celebrating water baptisms with you. There's a whole group of people that are ready to take this next step on Friday night and we want to encourage you to come and celebrate with them. This will be so encouraging to those that are taking this next step. So show up here on Friday at 7 and participate in the water baptism celebration with us. It's going to be a great time. If you don't have a Bible of your own, we'd love to make sure there's a copy in your hands before you leave church today. At the end of today's service, there'll be a friendly face at the table at the back of the auditorium ready to give a Bible to you. So make sure you stop by if you need a copy of God's Word. Hey Gateway, here's something you can be praying about this week. Many of you know Pastor Trung, and if you don't know him, he is the leader of Blessing Church in Hanoi, Vietnam. And Blessing Church also has an organization and network of drug rehab centers all across the country of Vietnam, as well as numerous church locations. They also give ministry to children that are hurting and need a place to stay. They welcome them into one of their children's homes. But recently, they've been hit with some very trying times in Vietnam due to COVID and the government's restrictions that they've put in place. It's been a very difficult time for the churches and rehab centers, as well as the spiritual needs of the people that attend their church. So Pastor Trung has reached out to us and asked you, Gateway, to be praying for them extra in these next coming weeks. They could really use your prayer support that God would strengthen them and give them the energy to do all that they can to reach people with the good news of Jesus in these strange COVID times in their country. Also that God would bring other leaders and helpers alongside as their ministries are growing to help them be the hands and feet of Jesus in Vietnam. We love them and we know that you do too. So we encourage you, please keep praying for Pastor Trung, his wife Huey, and all of their ministry leaders in Vietnam. Thank you, Gateway, for agreeing with us for them. Thank you, Gateway, for partnering with us so that we can keep advancing God's kingdom right here in Regina and with our missions commitments in Asia. There's three ways that you can continue to give into God's house. You can give in person today by dropping your giving in one of the giving boxes. You can also text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's appearing on the screen right now. And the third way that you can give is by giving online. Just head to our website and follow the prompts there. That's all I got for you. So have a great week, Gateway. We'll see you next Sunday. And Pastor Brian, over to you. How's everybody doing? You happy to be in church? Yeah, just take a moment right now and turn to somebody sitting next to you and say, I feel so honored to be sitting next to you. Yeah, hey, I want to especially acknowledge the newlyweds. Come on, Jeff and Cola, you two stand up so everybody knows who you are. They were married just yesterday afternoon right here in the sanctuary. 
It was a beautiful event, and good for you. You guys are in church the day after your wedding, and uh, we salute you. We're just happy for you. We know it's going to go very, very well in your future. All right. Well, today marks the halfway point in our series that we've been that we've been uh, looking at the last couple of weeks, and uh, the theme is highly motivated. Everybody say highly motivated. You know, there's one guy who was a best-selling author, very prolific writer. He was churning out all these novels, and one day he was being interviewed, and the interviewer said, "So, where do you get the inspiration when you write a new book?" And he said, "Well." I don't really think of it in terms of inspiration. I think of it more as motivation. And the interviewer said, okay, how do you get your motivation? He said, well, you know, when bills come in the mail, when those bills start piling up, that's my motivation to write another book and collect some more royalties, right? Come on, before we uh, dig into our subject today, would you with great gusto repeat after me? Come on, everybody say, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? All right, and once again, a special welcome to those who are joining us Online, good to have you along for the ride as well. Speaking of authors, in our series, we've been looking at the life of David, all right? You all know King David. One day in heaven, you're going to meet this man, but he was a highly motivated man of God. And each week in this series, I've been referencing a summer activity that we can all identify with. So in week one, it was good old-fashioned rock skipping contest and the message was highly motivated people tend to be highly competitive people. And we certainly saw David's competitive spirit on full display on the day when he took down Goliath. Imagine how the ground shook when Goliath came crashing down. Then last week in session number two, another familiar summer activity. Ever, ever heard of this? A summer job. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a popular summer activity, right? That's where we get our start, a summer job. Highly motivated people tend to be highly successful people. And David was a guy who went on to chalk up some, some really significant successes in his lifetime. But he got his start with a summer job as a junior shepherd. All right, that brings us to today's session and another summer activity that we can all relate to, and it's this, moving furniture. Yeah, I knew that would go over real big. <laughs> How many of you have ever moved or helped somebody else move on a hot summer day? Who's ever been there and done that? I'm pretty sure we've all had a taste of that. It's kind of a sweaty job, right? At least for guys it is. For girls, it's more of a perspirational experience, right? Guys sweat, girls perspire. That's just how it is. But folks, the message today is this. Highly motivated people tend to be highly committed people. Everybody say highly committed. There was one lady who came over to visit her friend one day. They were going to sit down and have a coffee at a visit. And, and when the lady came to answer the door, she was kind of huffing and puffing. And her friend that was standing on the doorstep said, why are you so out of breath? She said, because I just finished moving the Chesterfield from one side of the living room to the other, and that thing is a beast. And her friend said, well, why don't you just wait until your husband gets home later on? She said, because it's even harder to move when he's laying on it. <laughs> David knew about moving furniture. Folks, David was well aware that the most important piece of furniture on the face of planet Earth was the Ark of the Covenant. Have you ever heard of this thing, the Ark of the Covenant? It was not just a national treasure in Israel. <laughs> it was essentially the throne of God. And for many years, the Ark had been conspicuous by its absence from the house of the Lord. Let me just give you a quick summary so I can bring you up to date if you're not familiar with the history and the kind of the chronology of of, of what happened with the ark. Dating back to the era of Moses, 
God gave some very detailed instructions about how they should craft several pieces of furniture to go in the house of the Lord, which was called the tabernacle. Basically, it was a, a portable tent that could be packed up and moved from one geographical location to another. And there were seven pieces of furniture. The most important was the one that went in the Holy of Holies. So you got the outer court, and then you have the holy place, and then you venture further in where the presence of the Lord is in the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle. That's where the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was at home. But it was missing from the tabernacle for many years. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, just for those who, who want to kind of envision it, it was basically a wooden box. It was 45 inches wide. It was 27 inches deep and 27 inches tall. A wooden box overlaid with gold. Now, the box contained the Ten Commandment tablet and also Aaron's budding rod and a sampling of the manna from back in Moses' days. So it was the bowl of manna. It was also contained inside the ark. There was a lid on top of the box that was called the mercy seat, essentially the throne of the Lord. The mercy seat was made of gold, and attached to the mercy seat were two stylized angels called cherubim with wings. So they, 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 the angels were facing each other, and their wings were stretched out toward each other. And in that space between the wings of the cherubim on top of that mercy seat, that was said to be the very place where the presence of the Lord would dwell on earth and once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come into the Holy of Holies and there he would meet with the Lord. So very, very important piece of furniture. The ark, for all intents and purposes, represented the presence of God in the earth. Many years prior to David's era, the sons of the high priest at the time, Eli, the sons were named Hophni and Phinehas, and they made a very foolish mistake. They came up with the lame-brained idea that, hey, let's take the Ark of the Covenant with us to the battlefield, and that way we'll gain the upper hand and get a victory over our enemy. Dumb idea. What ended up happening was not only did they lose the battle, but the enemy army, the Philistines, captured the Ark of the Covenant away from the Israeli forces. So they took it to their camp. And it was no end of frustration to them, and eventually they sent it back. But the long story that's condensed is, is that the, the ark ended up sidetracked in the home of a man by the name of Abinadab. And there it sat for many years, 40 years plus. Some scholars believe that it was there for up to 70 years. But there is the ark sitting at the home of Abinadab. That's not where the ark belongs. The ark belongs in the house of God. Somebody say amen. Folks, for some strange reason, when King Saul, who was the king before David, when King Saul was on the throne of Israel, he had zero motivation to go and retrieve the ark. He did not lift a finger. He, apparently, it didn't even occur to him that, hey, we are missing the ark. Not missing in the sense that they didn't know where it was. They knew precisely where it was. But they were missing the Lord's presence in the house of God. And it did not occur to him, hey, we should go get the ark and bring it back to where it truly belongs. And so he was not motivated. Apparently, he just couldn't be bothered. But when David became king, wow. That was a totally different story. David was so highly motivated. The first thing on his agenda when he became king was to evict the Jebusites from Jerusalem and to claim that city for God. Because going back to the time of Joshua, when the Lord instructed them to go in and take possession of the promised land and to drive all the inhabitants out of the land, they did that, but they didn't, they, they, they weren't totally thorough in that campaign. So when all was said and done, and Joshua had led them to, to possess the promised land, there were still a few pockets of resistance here and there, including those stubborn Jebusites who had control of Jerusalem and David and all of Israel. They knew that's not right. 
We're supposed to occupy this entire territory. So when David came to power, first thing he set out to do was to claim Jerusalem for the Lord. And he did that. And the next thing on his mind was to go get the ark and bring it home where it belongs, in God's house, in God's city. Some of you very well understand the emotion of David because I just know you've had this thought cross your mind. When I become prime minister, some things are going to change around here. <laughs> That's how David felt. David's got to be sitting back in the wings. He, he, several years before he became king, he was anointed to be the future king. So he knew he was in line for the throne. And he's got to be sitting in, in the wings saying, Saul, what are you doing? Why don't you go get the ark? We need the ark. And he's thinking to himself, when I become king, well, that's going to be the first thing on my agenda. So David became a man on a mission. He brought together all of his leaders, and they came up with a plan for an epic celebration. They got the singers and all the musicians involved, and David wrote a song. He was a songwriter. He wrote a special song just for the occasion when they would welcome the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And it's in Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. And let the King of glory come in. It's the imagery of opening wide the doors of the main gates of the city of Jerusalem and escorting the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, into the city of God. And so David writes this song. They built a brand new wooden cart to transport the ark. The whole nation was invited to share in this event. David was so excited. He was highly motivated to move the furniture. No, not just any furniture, but the greatest article of furniture ever to grace planet Earth. We're going to bring the ark home. Welcome, Lord. You kind of catch what was going on in David's heart. So this scenario had all the necessary preparations for a smooth move, right? Like, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's read it and find out. 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000 of them. He and all of his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a brand new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. Abinadab had two sons, Yuza and Ohio, Ohio, not Ohio. Yuza and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. Presumably, Yuzo was walking behind it. So they are attendants to the ark in this move. Verse 5, David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. So they've got all these musical instruments going. It is a joyous atmosphere. But then all of a sudden, it became instantly somber. Verse 6, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Yuza reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. So naturally, he just wanted to steady the ark so that it didn't topple over. Sounds good to me. But verse 7 says, The Lord's anger burned against Yuza because of his irreverent acts, and therefore the Lord struck him down, and he died on the spot there beside the ark of God. Sounds a bit harsh. This is Old Testament territory. Apparently, no one told Yuza that the rule that the Lord had strictly set down at the time when he gave them the design of the ark, he said, oh, by the way, when you transport the ark, don't touch the ark. Do not touch the ark. Them's the rules. Nobody told that to Yuza. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Yuza. And to this day, that place is called Perez Yuza which means furniture moving gone bad. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It means that the anger of the Lord broke out against 
use of verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, if this is how it's going to be, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? How can we do this? Verse 10, he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Change of plan. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. You see, in verse 8, it says David was angry. Verse 9 says he was afraid. There's a whole range of emotions here. He's confused. He's sulking. He says, all right then, just forget it. Just take the ark to the nearest farmhouse, boys. Leave it there for now. That's what they did. Verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Three months. David is in a funk. I call it the 90-day fiasco. Not the 90-day fiancé. Who's ever seen 90-day fiancé? Who would not admit it if you had? <laughs> this is a 90-day fiasco. Wow. It's a crazy tragedy. A young man is dead. The king is pouting. The ark is in limbo. And the nation is perplexed. Now what? Verse 12 says, Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom where we left the ark. And everything he, he has is, is blessed because the ark of God is in his living room. They're like king. We need the ark. We need the presence of the Lord. We need God's blessing the way Obed-Edom currently is experiencing the blessing and favor of God because he's got the ark. King, the nation needs the ark to come home. Come on. We need to finish the job here. So they're getting in David's ear. Finally, David says, all right. All right. 90 days later. And so it says, David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoice. Oh, man. Apparently, David had received some, some coaching during those 90 days or at least some reminding, possibly, of something he already knew from his days as a kid in Hebrew school. But, but his advisors were telling him, listen, David, there's a set of policies and procedures for, for moving the ark. You see, the ark had these gold rings that were attached to the four uh, bottom corners of the Ark of the Covenant. And, and the plan is that, 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 that you put these poles, these staves, through those rings, and when you need to move the ark, only the Levites, only members from the priestly tribe, nobody else, not Yuza, not Ohio, the Levites are to lift the ark up with those poles and bear it on their shoulders. And that's how you move the ark. And so they got through to David with, with this, this proper method for for transporting this piece of furniture. So verse 13 says, When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wow. From Obed-Edom's place to Jerusalem is about five kilometers. How far had they gone of that five kilometers when this incident took place with Yuza? We don't know. Presumably there was still a couple of kilometers to go at least. And every six paces, David offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Wearing a linen ephod, which is a priestly garment. David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and with the sound of trumpets. Wow. Everybody shout, mission accomplished. Yeah, they brought the ark home. We've all had some experiences with moving furniture from point A to point B, right? Whether it's a whole truckload of furniture, a whole houseload of furniture, or, or whether it's just one single bulky item of furniture. We've all had some experience along this line. Do you remember the case of the man who was trying to move a washing machine one day, and he's got this kind of this thing kind of wedged in the front door of his house, and he's struggling with it, shifting it, trying to get this thing moved. He's working by himself, and along comes a guy down the sidewalk, and he sees this man struggling with this washing machine, and he bounds up the front step. Here, let me give you a hand with that. So now you got two guys that are wrestling with this washing machine, and about five minutes later, the guy that had come along said, man, at this rate, we'll never get this thing in there. And the other guy says, what are you talking about? I'm trying to get it out the door. You're working with me or against me? 
You see, the message today is highly motivated people tend to be highly committed people. Allow me to define these terms for you. So motivated, that's when you know that something needs to be done. In David's case, bring back the ark. When you know something is right, when you know it's important, when you know it's obviously the will of God. So you're motivated. You're not thinking, oh, who cares? No, you care. You are motivated. You know that something here is necessary. And so deep down inside, you're motivated to see it get done. Now, listen carefully. Motivation can go two directions emotionally. So if if we stick with the analogy of moving, it can be either negative or a positive experience when you have a move to make, when you've got some furniture to get shifted from one place to another. It could be very much a, a negative emotional trip because you're thinking, man, moving is such a hassle packing boxes, endless boxes boxes and and you got to clean up the old place before you you know turn the key over and and then you probably have to do some painting at the new place before you moving is such a hassle I so detest having to move it's no fun it's no fun but it is a necessary evil you see you're motivated to move even though you dislike moving because it's important you have to have a roof over your head You have to get this move accomplished. And so you're motivated to do the move even though you don't like moving. Or, on the other hand, moving could be a wonderful experience. You are so excited, honey. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be our first time having a home of our own. Or, honey, this is going to be a bigger house, a nicer house in a really great neighborhood. I'm so excited. Are you excited? Yes, I'm excited too. Pass me the packing tape. So it can be a wonderful experience moving. You're just so excited. You know, there's one family. They're moving. They're a family of five. Mom and dad, three kids, and they're moving into a bigger house than they had been living in. And so on moving day, they arrive, and the kids run into the house. And, man, the kids are tearing all over, and they're just scouting every corner of the house. And then the little guy comes down the stairs, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, I counted. There's five bedrooms in this house. Even you and Mom won't have to share a bedroom anymore. Thank you very much for that enlightening information. (laughs) Okay, so highly motivated means that we're highly aware of things that are vital, right? We have to make this move. It is important because the landlord is selling this house, so he's given us a date that we have to be out. And so even though we don't like moving or even though this is a thrilling thing, we're moving into an amazing place, one way or the other, negative or positive, Uh, Highly motivated means that you know that something needs to get accomplished. Now, let's define highly committed because that's different. Now, it's not just that you know what ought to be done, but now it's about are you committed to do something about it? Are you committed to do whatever it takes to get that thing done, even if it's downright difficult? So the person who is highly motivated, know what needs to be done. And the person who's highly committed gets it done, despite some of the stress and strain that's involved. Now, in David's case, was he highly motivated? Oh, <laughs> you better believe he was. He could hardly wait to, uh, to, 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 to take his place on the throne and be in, in the position to make decisions. The first decision, which would be, let's go get the Ark of God. And bring it home. So was David motivated? He knew exactly what the nation needed. Priority number one, bring the ark home. But was he highly committed to the task? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, he was. He rallied the troops. He put an elaborate plan in place. In fact, David went all out to welcome the Lord into the house of the Lord. And then he ran into a major snag. In fact, a fatality, a 90-day delay. He took it real personal. Like David felt responsible for the death of that young man. David was the one who had to go and sit down with Mr. and Mrs. Abinadab and with Yuza's brother, Ahio, and, and try to console the family. That's tough. That's really rugged. 
David suffered some serious emotional turmoil during those 90 days. I mean, he was put out with the Lord. Why did this happen? He was put out with himself. It's all my fault. I should have known better. That's not how you're supposed to transport the, 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 the ark. It was a painful lesson learned for the entire country. The star of David, the flag of Israel, was flying at half mast. But then David came out of that valley. His advisors got to him with these words of encouragement. Come on, David. We need the blessing that is involved with having the ark in our possession. Come on. Let's finish the job. Let's do this. And they got to him, and so he, he got back in the game, and, and so he recommitted to the Lord, and he recommitted to the, the task at hand. He said, boys, we're going to get the ark. We're going to try again, and this time we're going to do it right. And so he moved the furniture of the Lord into the house of the Lord, and there was much rejoicing, and that's, that's understating it. It was a massively important day in the history of Israel. What's the old saying? You can't keep a good man down. And you can't keep a motivated man down. You can't keep a motivated woman down. Have you ever heard the name Peter Daniel? Peter Daniel. I'm not talking about, you know, Peter and Daniel, the two men from the Bible. A guy by the name of Peter Daniel, when he was in grade four, he had a severe, severe learning disability. And his teacher, whose name was Mrs. Phillips, she, she made some very disparaging remarks to Peter Daniel and about Peter Daniel. She would, she would say things like, he does not have a very bright future because he's not a very bright boy. Ooh, that cuts deep. That's so mean-spirited, isn't it? But at age 26, Peter was still totally illiterate, could not read or write. But one of his friends began one day to read a book to Peter Daniel. And he read and he read. And they read that book all through the night. It was a best-selling book called Think and Grow Rich. And something in that book seriously impacted Peter Daniel. He became, well, in the terms that we're using in this session here this morning, he became highly motivated and highly committed to overcome some of his personal, personal obstacles in life. And today, you'll be happy to know that Peter Daniel owns a good chunk of the, the corners in, the, in that city where he used to be a fighter. Now he's a fighter in a different sense, fighting to overcome some of the hardships of life. And he wrote a book, and the book is entitled, Mrs. Phillips, You Were Wrong. You see, when you become a follower of Jesus, you gain a whole new sense of motivation. You know, you come to grips with the simple terms of the gospel, why Jesus died on the cross so he could effectively deal with that, that sin issue that, that all of humanity have been ill-affected by. And so we come to the realization somebody explains to us the good news about why Jesus died on the cross. He was taking the, the blame for us. He was bearing the judgment of God that our sins warranted. And, and he did that in our place as a sacrificial lamb so that he could let us off the hook. And so we come to the realization, Lord, I need you and I need to be spiritually reborn. So please come into my life and forgive me. Yeah, so we understand our experience of being forgiven, being redeemed, being reconciled back to God. And, and oh my goodness, this, this is what the Lord has done for us. And we get it. We get the gospel and it makes sense to us. And we come to this clear realization. This is so right. This is so important. This is, this is the thing to do. To live my life as a Christian. To live out a life that is God-honoring. Again, remember our definition of motivated. When you know what needs to be done, you know what is right. You know what is important. So highly motivated translates into, I know that I need to be a Christian and live for God. That's highly motivated. But it's not enough to be highly motivated. Highly motivated requires to go along with it, highly committed to do whatever needs to be done to get highly motivated accomplished. How many of you have discovered the Christian walk is not always as smooth as silk? Have you figured that one out by now? There could be some problems that will challenge your committedness to the Lord. There can be some obstacles that come up, some frustration. 
Yeah, some setbacks. There could be some 90-day fiasco. There could be some discouragement, some fiery darts. Remember that? Spiritual warfare, that whole arena. The Apostle Paul taught about that in Ephesians chapter 6. The fiery darts of the wicked one. There, there can be some inexplicable death in the family like the Abinadab. There could be all kinds of bumps in the road. But the question is, are we highly committed enough to weather those storms and deflect those darts and to press on, to keep going and stay committed to the cause of Christ? Come on, somebody help me out with a well-placed amen here. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, don't even think about quitting. You remember the words of Winston Churchill, fearless leader of the Allied forces in Great Britain during the, the time of World War II? Remember Winston Churchill? He, he's the one that, that told us that quitting is not an option. Actually, his exact words were, never give up. Remember that? It's a very famous quote. Never give up. Thanks to Winston Churchill's leadership, the Allied forces claimed a fantastic victory in World War II and shut down that, that Nazi regime and that lunatic. Hitler. Thank you so much, Winston Churchill, for encouraging us to never, ever give up. The world owes him a debt of gratitude to him. You see, highly motivated people are not quitters. They're committers and recommitters and re-re-committers. When the going gets tough, we hang in there, right? Folks, you understand, there's a difference between highly committed and sort of committed. There's a difference between highly committed and somewhat committed. Again, back to the analogy of moving furniture. Somewhat committed, sort of committed, kind of looks like this. On the day when, when you're supposed to be helping your friend move because they asked you if you would lend a hand and you committed yourself to, to help them with, with moving their furniture into their, their new place. But when the day arrives and, and, and you show up to help them with this move, you are not exactly a happy participant. Why? Because when you committed to help them, you didn't realize that there would be so few people helping. You thought they'd have a whole crew working on this, and, and you get there, and it's just the guy that's moving and you. Or when you committed to help, <laughs> you didn't know it was going to be minus 30 degrees Celsius, minus 40 with a wind chill. Or you committed to help move, but you didn't realize then that when the day arrived, it would be plus 30 degrees Celsius. Plus the humidity. When you committed to help, you thought it would only take a couple of hours. <laughs> really? When you committed to help, you didn't know they had that much furniture, including a piano. And two, count them, two of those crazy high hide beds Those are killers to move. Plus, they've got a pool table and a safe. When you committed to help move, you didn't know that they, they weren't finished packing yet. When the day arrived, I've helped a lot of people move over the years. There was, there was one time when we got there and we're looking around, you know, checking out what all needs to to be moved and packed into the truck. So we went down the basement. Here's this big full-size deep freeze. We open the lid, and it's still full of meat. <laughs> you didn't pack that stuff yet. <laughs> or maybe when you committed to help with the move, you didn't know that there would be unexpected delays, that there'd be a mechanical problem with the U-Haul truck. It's the X factor, right? It's the unknown. But because you are highly committed to this person, you don't bail out on Buddy halfway through the move. Oh, I got to go now. No, you cut through all of the annoying inconvenience of the situation, and you see that job through, and then you seriously celebrate. Hey, we did it. Thank you so much for helping me with the move. And all the while, you resist the urge to say, why didn't you just hire a moving company? You know, two small men with big hearts. <laughs> 
Got an amen on that. <laughs> Listen very carefully. One of the key factors that will cause a person to be highly committed is relationship. Everybody say relationship. You know this person. You love this family. You want to help this person that is asking you to help them with their move. It might be that a couple of years ago when you were moving that they gave you a hand and you're just returning the favor, but it's because of relationship that you are so readily willing to say, yes, of course, I will help you move your stuff. Have you ever had a perfect stranger approach you and say, oh, hey, listen, uh, at the end of the month, my family and I, we have to move into a, a different place, so would you be willing to give us a hand? <laughs> A perfect stranger. Yeah, do I know you? <laughs> it's like the guy who had the bumper sticker on the back of his pickup truck. You know the one. It says, yes, this is my pickup truck. No, I will not help you move. <laughs> the closest I've come to helping a stranger move, one day years ago when we were in Halifax, and a friend of mine and I, we were walking down the street, and, and here's these guys. They're carrying these boxes out, and they're putting them in the back of this U-Haul truck, and they've got the ramp up over top of the front steps of the house and we're going by and we kind of look at each other and so we say hey you guys need some help and they said do we ever so we said all right we rolled up our sleeves and we began to help them and we helped at least on that end of the move packing up the truck we couldn't help on the other end of the move but you know it's maybe an hour an hour and a half whatever and when we were done they they said oh uh, we, we'll give you some money and we said no 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 we just wanted to help and well we'll give you some beers <laughs> please do not give us any beers did David have relationship with the owner of the furniture? Yeah, no kidding. David loved the Lord. He was a worshiper extraordinaire. No wonder he was chomping at the bit. When I become king, he's got relationship with the Lord. When I'm king, man, we're bringing the ark home. Folks, have you ever thought about people or spoken of people as being individuals who are highly committed? Come on, in all of your interpersonal relationships with people, have there been people that you say, wow, that guy is so committed to the Lord. That guy is so committed to his family. That, that girl, she is so committed to her job. She's so committed to her children. Have you spoken about people in these terms? Have you known what it is, just the opposite, to, to talk about somebody and say, man, ah, we tried to get that person involved with you know, what we're doing here, but sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Man, the person, they're just not very committed. There's two different assessments, aren't there, for people that we've had dealings with. Now, here's, here's where it calls for real honesty, gut level honesty. What about you? What about me? What about every one of us in this room? The people that know you well, would they say that you are a highly committed type of person or not so much? Wow, that's convicting. That's challenging, isn't it? I say, Holy Spirit, help us to earn for ourselves a reputation of being that kind of man, that kind of woman that is a highly committed type of individual. You see how this works? Remember, motivated means we know what needs to happen. Highly committed means we're prepared to do whatever is necessary to make it happen. Let me give you three very quick application points, and I do mean quick. First one is this. Highly motivated means... I know very well that I need to help Jesus build his church. Right? Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. He needs lots of help to build his church in the earth. And we need to commit ourselves to that. I know that I need to connect with the Lord's people and with his plan. His great big plan is the church. Because we have relationship with Jesus, because we love him so much, I am highly committed to do whatever I can to help the Lord build his church. Man, there should be some amens flying at me right about now. How do we help the Lord build his church? Well, for one thing, remember what the silver rule is? Be there, man. When church is going on, I'm going to be there. Not only that, I want to help finance this thing. Not only that, I want to discover what my role is, what my gifting, what my calling is. And I want to roll up my sleeves and get involved and, and help the Lord to build his church and make this thing uh, just a, a strong representation of who the Lord is. If there is some adversity to be overcome in the process of, of building up the Lord's church, I'm up for that too. Help the Lord build his church. 
highly committed. I'm going to do my part. I'm highly committed to Jesus and therefore highly committed to help build his church and make her strong. Somebody say amen. All right, secondly, highly motivated means I know that I need to build my family. See, remember, motivation, highly motivated is, is when you know what needs to happen. I'm highly motivated in the sense that I know I need to build my family. And so, Lord, help me to be highly committed to do all I can to bless my household. To be an example of, of somebody that loves the Lord to my children and, and to my spouse. Help me to be that person that has deep respect for my wife. That cherishes my kids. That helps to create wonderful memories for my family. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me to be that person that will do whatever is necessary to build those relationships, to be there in the difficult moments, to do whatever I need to do to see to it that my family is strong and God-honored. Highly motivated. Highly motivated to build my family and highly committed to do all the little things that will help that to happen. All right, then thirdly, highly motivated means I know that as a Christian, part of my job is to reach out and help people. Oh, Lord, help me to be not only aware of the fact that, hey, a Christian is supposed to have, uh, you know, an eye that is on the lookout for hurting people, for struggling people, for people who need the Lord, for people who need help. Maybe they need help moving. Maybe they've got some emotional struggle and they need somebody to come to their rescue and listen to them and talk to them and pour some scripture truth into them. They need somebody that will pray with them. They need somebody that will do this journey with them for a while. Lord, I know, I know it. A Christian is designed and called to be somebody who helps individuals that we encounter along the way, especially when there's some sort of a pressing issue, when there's some sort of a problem, we're in a position to help. Instead of being that person that says, well, I got, I got enough problems of my own. I, I got my own agenda here. Oh, I, you know, that, that's not my problem. That's his problem. No, we dare not do that walk. Come on, we need to be on the lookout for people around us that are struggling people around us that could use some genuine encouragement in Jesus' name, and we're the agents that can do that. So we know very well a Christian is one who reaches out to love their neighbor. It's like the Good Samaritan thing. But if that's going to happen, We've got to be highly committed to do whatever those practical things are, whatever those spiritual things are whatever those highly emotional gestures are, to do whatever needs to be done to lift somebody up, help them to get their act together, maybe to introduce them to Jesus. Oh, my goodness. There's a calling that the Lord has placed upon every one of our lives. We need to make a decision to go after it. Come on, would you stand with me? It's decision time in the house of God. For some of you in this room, maybe the decision that you need to make today is, Lord, I need to be more committed to helping you build your church. For some others, it might be, Lord, I need to pull up my socks. And I need to be a little bit uh, more, more uh, uh, diligent about helping to build my family. My family's struggling in some ways. Lord, I need. I need to become more committed to do what needs to be done to get my family healthy and stable and strong. Let's do this, Lord. With your help, I know I can be an effective leader in my home. I can be an effective follower in my home. I've been distant from my parents. I've been rebellious against my parents. No more. No more. I'm going to do my part to help us to have a happy family. For some of you, 
The decision that you need to make before you walk out the door today is so, help me, Lord. I, I promise to be more highly committed to help build my family into the loving family that you want us to be. For others, it might be, yeah, pastor, it's true. I have, I have not been that brand of Christian that is on the lookout for hurting people. I guarantee every one of us in this room, in the next week or two, two weeks maximum, Every one of us will have a person cross our path that's going through something. They're struggling with some issue. They're hurting. They need help. And you might be just the one that could reach out and be there for them. Don't be so busy with your own stuff that you can't see the opportunity to help somebody else. In Jesus' name, make a decision. As we stand before the Lord right now, it's decision time. Come on, make a decision. For some, it might be all of the above. Maybe you, you need to work on all three areas. But let's dismiss from church today as men and women who are, are freshly recommitted to do what God has called us to do and to be what He's called us to be. Right now, just make a decision. Come on, heads bowed, eyes closed. Just you communing with the Lord. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I promise. I commit. I recommit. So help me, Lord. I want to be that person that is highly motivated and highly committed to make it happen. In Jesus' name. Yeah. All right, listen, before we officially conclude our service, I want to have the, the privilege of leading us in a simple prayer of faith. This is the prayer that we pray to affirm our place in the family of God. So again, with every head bowed, every eye closed, in this personal moment of commitment, if you're here today and you just know, Pastor, I need to turn my life over to the Lord. I need to be born again. Or I've gotten away from the Lord and I need to recommit myself to the cause of Jesus in my life. If that's you. And before we all pray this prayer together, just raise your hand wherever you are. Just wave at me across the room if you know. You need to commit or recommit to God's best plan for your life. Yes, I see your hand over here on my left. Thank you. You can put it down. Are there others? Who else? Yes, I see your hand at the back on my left. And I see your hand up further as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Before we pray together. Come on, church. Would you join me? Let's pray this. Dear Jesus, of course I want to serve you. After all that you've done for me, Help me to live the Christian life. I know you're the Son of God. I know you died on that cross. You rose from the grave to deal with my sin issue and give me a brand new start. Forgive me for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, to live a highly committed Christian life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Hey, what a Savior we serve. Thank you for watching this online service today. We hope you were encouraged by the worship and the message that you heard. And hey, we would love to see you out at one of our in-person Sunday services on a Sunday very soon. So why don't you think about that? Our Sunday service times are at 9.30 or 11.30, and it's great to be in community in God's house. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.